Sir, with your permission, can we start off, sir? I think. Yes, can you can. Go ahead. Yes, you can go ahead. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. So, a very good evening and welcome to one and all. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome on behalf of Biocon Biologic to all. So, today's webinar is the first the utilization of IVIG in him. Hematological malignancies, as well as with other uh, aspects of hematology. So, with that, I would also, you know, like to thank you all for your valuable time. And these sessions will not only help us to enhance our knowledge in the therapy area, but they will also help us in providing new ideas and also help us in improving the standards of care through the new questions that are actually generated by our participants. And these questions will be taken up by our esteemed speaker the end of today's session. So with that notice, and with that, I would like to go ahead. And... Welcome our speaker for today's session. Post his completion uh, in his field, he went on to pursue his higher education from the university in the UK and also he went on to obtain his specialist training in several domains of hematology, benign malignant diseases and transplantation. He was also awarded the fellowship of the Royal College of Pathologists. So post this completion, Sir has also pursued his as a senior consultant in the university. of Leeds in UK and also he's a uh, academic as well as in research and has published several papers in the field uh, of hematology and uh, sir, thank you very much for your time today sir we hand over the session to you good day thank you thank you very much for your kind introduction let me just start by sharing my slides first Yeah, uh, can you uh, can you see my slides on your screens? Yes, yes sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Me, yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's I must say this is not a very easy topic in the sense that uh, you know we often don't get uh, much uh, of a you know background on how we use IV immunoglobulins in hematological malignancies. Of course, in benign hematological disorders, there is quite a lot of IV immunoglobulin use, and most hematologists, if not all, are very well versed in uh, the place IV immunoglobulin has in treatment of benign disorders. So uh, in hematological malignancies, it's used. Uh, of course, there is a niche area where it can be used, but it's not something that we often uh, talk about. So therefore, uh, I must thank Biocon to provide me this opportunity to talk to you all about the IV immunoglobulin use in uh, hematological malignancies. So the history of IV immunoglobulin use is at least 100 years old. I think it was called as a curative serum. And the uh, very first few observations was when uh, rabbits immunized with tetanus toxins had uh, uh, blood had activity against tetanus poison. This was demonstrated by Von Bering in 1890. And for his uh, pioneering work in this field, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology. Uh, in Italy, by Cenci et al. in 1907, uh, uh, convalescent human serum was used in the prevention of measles. So plasma-derived pooled human immunoglobulins for intramuscular injection has been available for over 70 years. So initially, IV immunoglobulin preparations were rather impure and they caused a lot of allergic reactions, hence it was used intramuscular. Intravenous preparations, that is IVIG, has been in use for at least 30 years. So immunoglobulin preparations for clinical use are derived from large pools more than about 10,000 liters of donor plasma by a fractionation process, which was again pioneered by Korn and Onkley in 1940s. 
So most of the audience will be very well versed with this cartoon, which uh, simplifies the structure of an immunoglobulin. It's got two heavy chains and two light chains. Both the heavy chains and the light chain have a variable region, which is shown as interrupted dots. And there's a constant region, which is shown as a constant continuous line. So the active antigen binding site is called the FAB and the, F and the rest of the portion is called the FC portion of the immunoglobulins. So of course, we are not going to talk about uh, primary immunodeficiency syndromes. We are going to talk about secondary hypogamma globulinemias. So uh, what are the situations one encounters uh, secondary hypogamma globulinemias? It can be due to excessive immunoglobulin loss as seen in protein losing enteropathy, nephrotic syndrome, severe burns, et cetera. Neoplastic disorders, of course, hematological neoplasms, especially B cell neoplasms like CLL, myeloma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, thymoma, et cetera. Then they can also be seen in anti-B cell uh, monoclonal antibody treatment with rituximab, ofatumumab, and obinutizumab. Um, it can be seen in uh, BCR signaling pathway inhibitors, of which the most prominent drug is ibrutinib. Uh, it can be seen in patients who are on corticosteroids and on tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and also in anticonvulsants. We should not forget with the emerging CAR T cell therapy directed against CD19 positive B cells, hypogamma globinemia is becoming an increasingly difficult problem to, to sort out. So, you have two different types of hypogamma globulinemia. You have to be aware that you can have a low function of gamma globulins in spite of having normal globulin levels. So true hypogamma globulinemia is when the globulin levels are low, that is plus or minus more than two standard deviation from the normal. And functional hypogamma globulinemia is when the total serum immunoglobulin G is within the normal range but specific antibodies are lacking. For example, pneumococcus specific antibodies, et cetera, are lacking, which means that though the numbers are, though the amount is normal, the function is deficient. This kind of functional hypogamma globulinemia is also common in B cell neoplasms. Functional hypogamma globulinemia, it may result from clonal proliferation of cells secreting a paraprotein. It can be due to excessive polyclonal B cell activation in response to chronic infection, and also due to immunosuppressive activity of abnormal B cells. We have to keep in mind that we are using plenty of rituximab and others anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies like ofatumumab and also BCR uh, and also ibrutin, uh, ibrutinib, which is a bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor and CAR T cells. These new therapeutics also cause a significant hypogamma globulinemia, which we have to be aware of. So just to set the ball rolling, the important question is, which among these patients should receive IV immunoglobulins? Just having a hypogamma globulinemia is not sufficient. You have to demonstrate that patient has got chronic or recurrent infections, especially of the sinopulmonary tract. So there is not much evidence to use just uh, replace globulin just because they are low. Uh, in fact, patients should have demonstrable symptoms due to their deficiency before you set out to correct the hypogamma globulinemia. And also, some of these patients with functional hypogamma globulinemia have low titers of specific antibodies against vaccines. So normally what we do is uh, when we have demonstrated that there is a clinical need for IV immunoglobulin replacement, Usually we do a trial of 0.4 to 0.5 gram per kilogram monthly IV or uh, subcutaneous use is becoming increasingly uh, attractive. So if you're using subcutaneous, subcutaneous route, you can give 100 to 200 milligram per kilogram weekly subcutaneous for six to 12 months. In fact, uh, in the West, a lot of people use subcutaneous route and in fact, patients self-administers. Dose and schedule will, may, will need adjustment according to clinical response and also to some extent with the trough immunoglobulin levels. But do not aim for a target serum immunoglobulin G levels. Be guided by the clinical response that the patient may show. So when we are talking about uh, functional hypogamma globulin, how does one say that the patient has got hypo functional uh, lack in uh, globulins in spite of having normal levels. It is by looking at 
the way they mount an antibody responds to certain uh, immune stimulus like a vaccine. So the commonly used vaccine to demonstrate this is uh, by um, is by uh, looking at uh, response to the polyvalent pneumococcal capsule polysaccharide vaccine. So you can have either mild, moderate, or severe deficiency based on how much of uh, antibody response you have to the various serotypes in the vaccine. So this is a classification how as to uh, you put patients into different class as they're having mild or moderate or severe deficiency. So this is useful to demonstrate functional deficiency. So we, what we've done so far is just give background knowledge about uh, why we have to think about IV immunoglobulin replacement. So what we'll do is we'll take up some specific diseases and also certain specific treatment conditions to go through uh, how we manage these. So uh, most of this audience are uh, um, hematologists or hemato-oncologists. So this is a cartoon that is very well known to them. Multiple myeloma may progress to various stages with an asymptomatic NGUS phase followed by sometimes a smoldering type of presentation to symptomatic myeloma. So at every stage of this disease, there is some uh, alteration in the immune uh, uh, globulin levels. So again, to this audience, these uh, slides will be very familiar. So there is no need to go through them in detail. Uh, small, basically active myeloma is if you have symptoms or uh, you've got a, um, the newer criteria is if you have serum free light chain ratio of made more than 100 or uh, more than 60% clonal bone marrow plasma cells. Okay, this cartoon hasn't come out well. Maybe this is because uh, I'm using an Apple product. So um, important thing is, of course, symptoms of myeloma are plenty. And the ones that prompt us to treatment is high calcium, renal failure, anemia, etc. But one has to remember that some of these patients, their initial presentation will be with infection and they may have accompanying uh, hypogamma globulinemia. So infections in myeloma is very common. They may be due to impaired lymphocyte function, suppression of normal plasma cell function, or due to hypogammoglobulinemia. Streptococcal pneumonia and gram-negative organisms are the most frequent pathogens, and most common infections are pneumonias and upper urinary tract infections. Pneumococcus, staph aureus, and klebsiella are common in the lung. E. coli and other gram-negative organisms in the, in the urinary tract. So this is, uh, uh, this is based on a recent study that was published in June, 2000, in, uh, June 2020. So there have been uh, quite a few population-based uh, studies on uh, infections in multiple myeloma. Uh, we know that infection is a major complication and a leading cause of death in patients with multiple myeloma. There are two Swedish studies, one showing that invasive pneumococcal disease in multiple myeloma is about one fortnight fold higher compared in myeloma patients compared with their normal, with normal cohort. And again, another population-based uh, study showed that the risk, relative risk of having a pneumococcal infection is at least sevenfold higher in myeloma, and the risk was 11-fold higher in the first few months after diagnosis. So infection in myeloma is a real problem, and one of the contributing factors may be a low, function, low functional globulin level um, or an absolute decrease in gamma globulins. So if you look at uh, relative risk of different infections, sepsis, again, that's about the hazard ratio is about 30 and for the herpes zoster, it's 25.8, but most infections, bacterial, pneumonia, et cetera, is much more common. If you look at the hazard ratio for pneumonia, it's 7.7. Just tells you that infections are a very uh, important problem to tackle right at the diagnosis. So 9.9% of patients who diagnosed with myeloma in a registry died within two months of diagnosis, and of them, 25% were due to deaths coming from infections. So immune parasitosis, when you have 25% uh, reduction in the normal functional immunoglobulins, 
So well, there was a study that looked at uh, overall survival and progression-free survival in patients who have immunoporous parasites at presentation. Although the overall survival is very similar between patients who have immunoparesis and no immunoparesis, but the progression-free survival shows that uh, patients who don't have immunoparesis tend to take a longer time to progress. So there's another group of, uh, another group of patients who suffer from chronic lymphocytic leukemia who also have complicating hypogamma globulinemia. So if you look at infections in CLL, the risk factors are many. It can be disease-related risk factors, such as advanced stage bone marrow involvement, et cetera, but also can be treatment-related. Treatment-related meaning it can be due to purine analogs, monoclonal antibodies, standard steroids, or even alkylating agents. So all patients are not at the same risk, and we really need to have a preventive strategy in these patients. So again, uh, infections in CLL may be due to very low gamma globulin levels, decreased cell-mediated immunity, or plain uh, leukopenia. Therapy, again, contributes to significant immunosuppression in CLL. So in order to prevent infection at CLL, uh, you need to identify high-risk patients. You should look at uh, providing adequate prophylaxis with various agents. And generally, depending upon what agent you use to treat, you have to anticipate certain types of infection and use appropriate prophylaxis. So in CLL patients, you can use growth factors to prevent uh, severe neutropenia, but it's important to recognize that some of these infections may be due to hypogamma globulinemia. So you need to check immunoglobulin levels and give IV immunoglobulin if they have recurrent sinopulmonary infection and the hypogamma globulinemia. It's important to actively immunize uh, all patients with hematological disorder with appropriate immunization, uh, so pneumococcal and influenza vaccine, et cetera. So infection in CLL, just like in uh, myeloma, is an important complication. Pneumonia is the most common, but you can have different types of bacteremia. You can also have uh, urinary tract infection, if you have large lymph nodes obstructing the urinary tract, herpes virus is common. If you have advanced disease and if they've had uh, very immunosuppressive treatment like fludarabine or uh, campath, et cetera, they are prone to mycobacterial and uh, endemic mycosis. So this is a study uh, where uh, the they looked at uh, patients with ibrutinib and incidence of pneumonia. So if you look at uh, uh, the graph A, uh, if you look at uh, pa patients who have received ibrutinib for one year, one to two years, and two to three years, there's a cumulative increase in incidence of pneumonia. Pneumonia is the second on the uh, y-axis. So whether you've got new patients or relapsed refractory patients, in patients with ibrutinib, you have high incidence of uh, chest infections and pneumonia. So of course we use rituximab uh, and other anti-CD20 antibodies in uh, CLL and that tends to result in a hypogamma globulinemia. So there is a study that was uh, looking at hypogamma globulinemia in rituximab and they found that uh, the incidence was rather high and uh, symptomatic hypoglobulinemia among patients who received multiple course of rituximab was common. So they advised the baseline and periodic monitoring of serum immunoglobulins, which I think we generally don't tend to do. So from the same study, they looked at uh, baseline hypogamma globulinemia in patients with uh, CLL, uh, baseline hypogamma globulinemia with CLL, and uh, also looked at new onset hypogamma globulinemia after rituximab. If you look at this slide, uh, for example, IgG deficiency was seen as, uh, in 15% of patients at baseline, and subsequently, 33% um, uh, after they've had rituximab. That was uh, seen in IgA and IgM as well. So although there is baseline hypogamma globulinemia, you exacerbate the uh, decrease in glo globulin levels when you use rituximab. So amongst this cohort of patients, there were, uh, these are the, this is the break, breakdown of uh, infection. And uh, 
So there is a significant proportion of patients who have hypogammaglobinemia when receiving IV immunoglobulin, they tend to have fewer infections. Again, uh, this is another study which looked at secondary hypogammaglobinemia after rituximab and fludarabin in indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is a retrospective cohort study. So as we know, fludarabin is highly immunosuppressive. So this uh, particular graph shows that hypogamma, this basically shows you the hypogamma globulinemia free survival after treatment with regimens, including R versus R free regimen. Um, in the left, uh, the, the panel titled A in small case shows uh, rituximab with fludarabin and fludarabin alone. The red curve is rituximab with fludarabin, and you can see that the incidence of hypogamma globulinemia is rather profound. When you use rituximab with CHOP and CVP, it's not that significant. But this is something to bear in mind when you combine rituximab and fludarabin. So having set, uh, you know, having set the uh, evidence for presence of this hypogamma globulinemia, let's look at how it's managed. So IV immunoglobulins in the management of hematological malignancies. So we know that it's derived from plasma. It's a pool plasma from which you may, if, from which you manufacture immunoglobulins. It is rather a complex process going through various degree of fractionation and purification. Most of the immunoglobulin is immunoglobulin G and uh, more than 90% is monomeric immunoglobulin G. There can be traces of other immunoglobulins and serum proteins. There's sometimes other addition of sugar, amino acids, and albumin to stabilize immunoglobulin G from aggregation. I think current products are uh, free of a lot of these additional uh, uh, substances. In fact, what is well known is if you have a lot of sugar and IV immunoglobulin, you tend to have acute kidney injury. So the intact FC receptor is important for biological uh, function, which helps in opsonization, phagocytosis, complement activation, antibody-dependent cytotoxicity. It has a normal half-life compared with serum immunoglobulin G and has a normal proportion of IgG subclasses. Broad spectrum of antibodies to bacterial and viral antigens are represented in uh, commercial preparations of IV immunoglobulins. So the production process, unfortunately, this cartoon hasn't come out well, but uh, it's probably not that relevant, but we know that it's a pool plasma product. Uh, donor have been screened for all the viruses, and there's also virus inactivation processes at the end, resulting in a commercial preparation of IV immunoglobulins. So pharmacokinetics of IV immunoglobulins is something important to look at because when you give IV immunoglobulins, the early alpha phase or the high peak phase is followed by a late beta phase when the immunoglobulin levels go down. And just before, after about uh, four weeks, it touches the bottom. And you have to ensure that your trough uh, immunoglobulin level is at least close, close to 400 uh, milligrams. So, this kind of a peak and trough is avoided by giving repeated subcutaneous use, which is becoming increasingly popular. See, we, biological effects of IV immunoglobulin is very well known to this audience. It's involved in op opsonization, phagocytosis, and various other cellular immunofunction. So IV immunoglobulins can be used in primary and secondary immunodeficiency. Secondary immunodeficiency, we earlier looked at a slide where it showed various situations where patients get secondary immunodeficiency. And of course, in hematology, it's CLL and myeloma mostly. So if you have A gamma globulinemia, severe hypogamma globulinemia, give a loading dose of one gram per kilogram IV, but otherwise you can just start with 300 to 400 milligram per kilogram every three to four weeks. Um, high catabolism, or if there is more frequent infections, you may have to dose them more frequently than uh, four weeks. If, one important thing is if someone has got active infection, better to avoid giving IV immunoglobulins because an active infection, there'll be a lot of antigen around, and this immunoglobulin, which is an antibody, can combine with the antigen and cause a lot of immune complex mediated issues. So in an active infection, you should avoid IV immunoglobulin, and you need to give antibiotics to get them better before you can uh, give them a dose of IVIG. If you're really hard pressed to use IV immunoglobulins in patients with infection, use a smaller dose, 
and uh, two weeks later after they've recovered, give them a full dose. Again, infusion rate, follow the product insert. A lot of the immediate side effect is due to rapid infusion. Just start at 0.01 ml per kilogram per minute and double the rate at 15 to 30 minutes, closely monitoring them. So monitoring therapy, you have to look at uh, whether they have uh, had an adequate dose and more importantly, you look for a clinical response. As I told you, the actual trough may not be that important if they're having a good clinical response. Always also keep in mind that you need to think about complications that can arise from their treatment and you need to look out for them as well. So this is a, uh, a graph which shows IV immunoglobulin dose and the trough immunoglobulin G levels. On the x-axis, you've got the IV immunoglobulin dose. Just concentrate on where it says 400. And if you just draw an imaginary line from 400 to meet the curve, it is somewhere around the trough level of about 400 uh, milligram per deciliter. So based on that, you have to aim for keeping the trough level around 400 to 500 uh, milligram per deciliter. So that can be achieved by a 0.4 gram or a 400 milligram per kilogram body weight dose. So unfortunately, this uh, slide has come out very poorly, but what it said was the incidence of infection was much lower at that particular dose. So IV immunoglobulin has its own problems. You've got uh, acute adverse reactions, which can be classified as mild, moderate, or severe, like headache, malaise, fatigue, flushing, pruritus, sometimes even uh, bronchospasm and anaphylaxis. And you can have delayed adverse reactions like headache, which can come on and last for about uh, two to three days, and uh, moderate to severe uh, symptoms such as dizziness, nausea, arthralgia, etc. Some, But I, what I'd like to do apart from this slide is to highlight on certain important complications. See, you can have, what you tend to have with IV immunoglobulins is anaphylactoid reactions rather than true IgE-mediated anaphylaxis. What is the big difference is that in anaphylactoid reactions, you tend to have hypertension and not shock. And uh, it's usually related to infusion rate. And if you slow the infusion rate or temporarily stop, it tends to go. Anaphylaxis is seen mostly in IgA deficient individuals who have anti-IgA antibodies. But although we talk about this a lot, this situation is currently very rare. And I think uh, uh, Pradyumna can correct me. The newer preparations have hardly any IgA left in them. So it's a very, very rare complication, but you have to be aware of this. Patients with IgA deficiency may have anti-IgA antibodies and uh, they may result in anaphylactoid or anaphylaxis-like situation. Uh, subcutaneous road, again, has got another advantage in terms of minimizing these acute events. So again, as we alluded to before, uh, immune complex mediated reactions are common in people with acute infections due to formation of antigen antibody complex. So avoid them. Many patients tend to develop migraine like headaches, which usually tends to happen two to three days after. It should not be con confused with aseptic meningitis. But aseptic meningitis, again, is an exceedingly uncommon situation, but it's seen in patients who receive high dose IV immunoglobulin in autoimmune neurological conditions. There are other issues one need to be aware of. Acute kidney injury, it's usually due to uh, presence of additives like sucrose in the immunoglobulin preparation. That is again becoming uh, very unusual in the current set of uh, uh, products that we have. And you always, you have to identify people who are prone for acute kidney injury and have to address certain issues like, you know, give them adequate hydration before you give IVIG. Thrombosis, again, is quite an important thing to think about. But again, I have to emphasize that thrombosis is extremely rare. Uh, but you need to keep that in mind, especially in certain select populations. Acute hemolysis also can happen. But again, that's very rare. That usually happens in A or B blood group when they have high theta anti-A, anti-B uh, plasma. So this forest plot on IV immunoglobulin and thrombosis just tells you that uh, Actually, the incidence of thrombosis uh, is rather, uh, if you look at most of these, uh, most of the dots, they're right bang in the middle, meaning that 
there is actually no demonstrated big difference between incidence of thrombosis in patients with IV immunoglobulin or controls. But there are just the odd studies which show that there is a slightly higher incidence of IV immunoglobulin related thrombosis. In fact, one of my uh, colleagues who works in immunology in uh, uh, the UK, she was just mentioning me today, mentioning to me today that uh, in fact they've stopped consenting for thrombosis as a risk factor for uh, uh, patients receiving IV immunoglobulins. So this is a study uh, published in uh, Blood in 2015, which looked at IV immunoglobulin and thromboembolic adverse events in patients with hematological malignancy per se. So if you look at uh, arterial uh, thromboembolic event, one year cumulative incidence in uh, the hazard ratio is about 1.38 and venous thromboembolic event is 1.27 and composite endpoint, both arterial and venous is 1.36. So um, you're actually looking at a rather rare complication. However, you need to keep that in mind. And in certain specific subset of patients with severe hyperviscosity uh, uh, or who are prone to arterial or venous events, this might be something that you need to keep in mind. The extreme right-hand side of the graph shows the numbers needed to harm. So in order to produce one uh, particular one stroke in a one year of treatment, you have to have at least 150 treatment episodes. So it's rare, but need to keep in mind. Again, as I told you, AKI is rare, but uh, it's seen with sucrose containing IV immunoglobulin products. Acute hemolysis is in patients with A or B blood group who may have anti-B or anti-A high titers and uh, who may have underlying active inflammatory diseases. Rarely this uh, IVIG can be see, can produce transient neutropenia and transfusion associated lung injuries. So generally use antihistaminics or uh, also acetaminophen and some steroids dose as uh, pre-medication to avoid these reactions. So this is a UK group for immunoglobulin replacement therapy in myeloma. Uh, this is however it was published in Lancet in 1994. So they're not really recent guidelines, but did talk about uh, giving IV immunoglobulins in patients who had recurrent infections and hypogammaglobinemia, and it uh, talked about a beneficial effect of the same. So why does this happen in myeloma? You have reduced levels of polyclonal immunoglobulin, uh, which is uh, related to disease-related suppression of CD19 positive B cells. And you also have abnormal production of TGF beta, which has B cell immunosuppressive effects and reduce signaling from T helper cells necessary for normal B cell function. A retrospective analysis of more than 3,000 subjects with plasma cell myeloma in the UK MRC trial between 1980 to 2002 showed 10% deaths within 60 days of trial entry was due to in among the 10% deaths that happened in the first 60 days after trial entry, 45% were due to infection. So it's something that you need to keep in mind. Again, this is from the same Lancet 1994 study, which showed that compared to placebo, giving IV immunoglobulins has uh, reduced the time to, has increased the time to first infection and also time to first serious infection. But you have to bear in mind that these trials are in 1994. So they are fairly, uh, they're not really recent ones. This was a time when we didn't have many of the treatment that we use in myeloma at present. This was probably the CVAD era and Melphalan era. So this is uh, uh, three important trials of myeloma and IV immunoglobulins. Again, 93, 94, and 95, they all showed that there were fewer infections in the IBIG groups and fewer serious infections. And the optimal dose was uh, determined to be 0.4 gram per kilogram body weight. So because of uh, sparse data, we do not recommend routine use of IV immunoglobulin patients with plasma cell myeloma and asymptomatic hypogammaglobulin without serious infections. What it says is you have to have a clinical need. That is what is important. 
So we still not very clear whether IV immunoglobulin replacement or prophylaxis is useful in patients with more than one serious infection, but I think it's a reasonable approach to take when patients have low antibody levels, especially low functional antibody levels. So you need to keep that in your armamentorium. So now moving on to CLL and IV immunoglobulins, there have been uh, trials again, but if you look at the dates of these trials, they're all ranging from 1988 to 1996. There are no recent large scale trials. And they've all shown that if you have, uh, if you replace IV immunoglobulins, you tend to have lower bacterial infections and the optimal dose again in CLL was 400 milligram per kilogram body weight. So this is the 2012 guideline on diagnosis, investigation, management of CLL from the British uh, Society for Hematology. So this is their recommendations. They say that immunoglobulin replacement therapy should be considered as a means of reducing the incidence of bacterial infection in patients with a low serum IgG level who have experienced a previous major or recurrent minor bacterial infection, despite optimal antibacterial prophylaxis. So you need to keep all that in mind. You know, patients who have, it's a clinical need-based treatment. The goal should be to reduce the incidence of infection and the immunoglobulin dose should be adjusted accordingly. Patients should be reviewed regularly to evaluate the effectiveness of immunoglobulin replacement therapy and whether there is a continuing need for treatment. Patients who develop serious and are recurrent infections despite antimicrobial prophylaxis and immunoglobulin replacement should be managed with infectious disease specialists, etc. So that is a role for immunoglobulin in CLN. Acute leukemia, again, there is compromised B cell immunity. And uh, there have been earlier studies which looked at uh, acute leukemia, uh, but I think uh, it is not, uh, most of the infections in acute leukemia tend to be neutropenia related, so it doesn't have a major role. Now coming to transplant. In transplant, IV immunoglobulin was seen to uh, be used in reducing infection, especially CMV specific uh, immunity and also in reducing the incidence of GVHD. But if you again look at the major randomized trials, they're all uh, at least uh, 20 years old, and uh, they've all looked at uh, different uh, IVIG dosing schedule. And even during that time, there was no difference in infection, GVHD, or mortality. So use of IVIG within the context of HSCT is now becoming less common compared to a couple of decades or two or three decades ago. So CMV prevention was an important area where IV immunoglobulin was used. If you look at uh, the panel figure one, panel A and B, this looked at uh, the probabilities of, uh, of detecting CMV infection and the occurrence of CMV disease in patients who have received or not received IVIG. The dashed lines are the ones who have the prophylaxis. So if you look at uh, probability of uh, occurrence of CMV disease, it's almost equal whether you get immunoglobulins, IVIG or not. So that is not a major role for preventing CMV infection. These are trials conducted well before you had effective uh, prophylactic agents against CMV. Again, CMV, this is again uh, days after transplantation and probability of detection of CMV infection in the groups with or without immunoglobulin prophylaxis. The panel A is uh, patients who received HLA mismatched transplant and panel B is elderly patients with that transplant. Again, no big difference between using and not using IV immunoglobulins. If you look at the forest curve for prevention of IV GVHD with IV immunoglobulin, there's hardly any uh, uh, study that uh, study that uh, favors using IV immunoglobulins. So again, in GVHD, it's not that useful. So this is again another forest plot which shows clinically documented infections in uh, patients who either received IV immunoglobulins or placebo. If you look at all the dots, blue, yellow, everything is right at the middle. So IVIG does not actually uh, prevent infections in transplant situation. Again, this is uh, CMV infection. If you look at uh, the graph, so there is hardly any difference between incidence of interstitial demonitis or CMV infection between using or uh, not using. The difference is, if at all anything, very marginal. But um, 
one or two studies have shown that there's an increased incidence of vena occlusive disease if you use IVIG in the transplant set, uh, situation. So uh, this is a misplaced slide. Again, this along with the BCSH guideline, this is the NCCN guideline, which tells you that you have to use IVIG if uh, patients have significant infection and hypogammaglobinemia. Now coming to a very important uh, current situation, we are using a lot of CAR T cells in lymphomas and uh, B cell malignancies, and there are CD19 and CD22 targeted CAR T cells, which result in gross depletion of uh, B cells resulting in severe hypogammaglobinemia. And these patients, this is where, this is a situation where you really have a strong indication to use immunoglobulins. In fact, the hypogammaglobinemia can be severe and persistent for months to years. So, so in fact, certain, uh, pay, certain uh, study groups use almost like prophylactic IV immunoglobulins along with CAR T cell infusion to avoid the unnecessary side effects. So we are nearing the end of this uh, talk. So what have we learned from this talk? Secondary hypogammaglobinemia or a specific functional hypogammaglobinemia is seen in patients with CLL, myeloma, and various other B cell neoplasm. So it is something that is real and present. And as clinicians, you have to bear that in mind and probably you should have all the baseline values with you. Efficacy and cost benefit and risk benefit analysis of immunoglobulin replacement therapy. Most of the large scale studies have been in 90s and early 2000s. They have failed to yield consistent answers. That is because of uh, now we know that these diseases are not single disease and the therapy they get are very varied. That does not mean that there is no role for immunoglobulins. There is a role, but you have to be very clear and very um, meticulous in your patient selection. So when you decide to give immunoglobulin, it should be based on uh, disease type, the amount of hypogammaglobulinemia, what therapy they've received, what has been their history in terms of previous infections, and how they have responded to anti-infective vaccines. So there's always a subset of myeloma and CLL patients who will need IV immunoglobulins. So before you give IV immunoglobulins, you should make sure that your patients with hematological neoplasms have received adequate vaccinations. So vaccine responses, specific antibody titers, history of infection and plan for therapy should be clearly recorded. And if you're giving IVIG treatment, you should start at 0.4 grams or 400 milligram per kilogram per month intravenously or 100 to 200 milligram per kilogram per week subcutaneously. Your target serum IgG level has to be close to 400 to 500 milligram per deciliter trough level, but you base your response and base your further treatment based on clinical response. So that brings us to an end, uh, to, uh, that brings this talk to an end. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Prabhu, sir, for a very insightful talk. Uh, that you have covered a very large domain as well of two infections, but also touched upon the most recent therapies and how IgG can be beneficial in actually countering infections in this area. So there are a few questions from our participants. But uh, prior to uh, moving to those questions, sir, the, uh, we would like to also uh, uh, have your opinion on your personal experience with uh, IBIG, in the, at least in the myeloma and the CLL. Yeah. So, so as I told you, uh, see all the, I mean, uh, we, to be honest, and an, an honest answer would be, we often right. don't think of hypogammaglobinemia until we see a situation where, you know, the patient has been coming with repeated infection related admissions. That is the time you look at uh, globulin levels and you look at uh, specific immunoglobulin levels and you think about replacing. So that tends to happen in a relatively small proportion of patients. But uh, in my practice, I've used in uh, maybe 5% of patients with myeloma or, or CLL. And where I've used, I think I've managed to keep patients out of hospital. So it's a very small proportion of patients. However, it's a very important, uh, you know, important and useful uh, uh, therapeutic uh, intervention to have with you. Right, right, sir. 
thank you for that sir uh, in continuation to flow with that question uh, question sir we'd also there's a question from the panelists uh, what are the clinical criteria that you would choose uh, to start off therapy with ibig sir thinking the rational or the maximum benefit of any particular clinical criteria that you would be choosing i think the clinical criteria would be uh, you know repeated sinopulmonary infections you know there is no set criteria what i tend to do is uh, if a patient is getting let's say admitted uh, in a year about three or four times with pneumonias or uh, other pulmonary infections then uh, you tend to look at immunoglobulin levels i think i generally in anybody who gets admitted with a serious infection i tend to look at the immunoglobulin levels right sir thank you for sharing your thoughts on that sir so the other question that's come up is sir sir uh, with regard to uh, multiple myeloma in the phase that is prior to frank development of myeloma that is the monoclonal gammopathy of un uh, unknown significance as well as smoldering myeloma uh, how has been the infection rates and has there been utilization of ibig well i mean uh, in my view when patients have have mgus i haven't seen any patient with mgus have infections due to hypogamma globulin i might be wrong but yes. uh, to the best of my knowledge actually i haven't really seen uh, many patients with uh, developing infections when they have mgus and certainly not replaced immunoglobulins in such patients right sir right sir thank you for that sir uh, so the next question that's come up is uh, with re- when uh, these patients particularly might also require vaccination has there been an interaction in terms of the ivig or vaccination therapy or how do we ideally play, uh, space it out sir? See, so, the next vaccination is something that uh, one uh, tends to forget especially you know when you're thinking about uh, various other therapeutic modalities you're thinking about your chemo and other agents you tend to forget about uh, vaccinations i think yeah. it's very important to give uh, you know not of, of course not live vaccines but uh, you know vaccines like influenza and pneumococcal vaccines because you tend to have uh, many of the morbidities even after they have been treated with either with you know CLL patients might have had treatment with fludarabine which would have depleted their lymphocytes and would have caused uh, hypogamma globulinemia they may be on rituximab they may be on maintenance rituximab so such patients it's really important to think about uh, vaccination especially with uh, vaccination for influenza and vaccination against uh, pneumococcus so it's very important to think about that and uh, use them fairly on a regular basis right sir right thank you for your thoughts on that sir so apart from the uh, other question that's come up is apart from the hematological malignancies uh, what are the other indications that in your general practice you feel that this ibig definitely plays a good role as well oh well, within within hematology i think the commonest reason yes. we use iv immunoglobulin is itp you know right. that is the commonest uh, situation where we use um the itp where a patient needs an urgent increase in platelet count either because they have to undergo a surgery or they are bleeding heavily we use ivig at 1 gram per kilogram body weight for 2 days so total of 2 gram per kilogram body weight and uh, that is the commonest use apart from that in other autoimmune hematologic condition one can use but it's not that useful in autoimmune hemolytic anemia so it's mainly in itp the other situations where we have used uh, a lot of ivig is uh, we see some patients with adult patients with uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytic syndromes where you know you have to use some kind of immunosuppression but if the drive for the hlh or hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytic syndrome is uh, an infection you're not able to give steroids in such situations we've used ivig um apart from that if you look at there are many other autoimmune uh, blood conditions like for example uh, acquired hemophilia etc where we've used but mainly mm-hmm. the outside hematological malignancies is itp of course right. within uh, other specialties there's quite a lot of use of ivig especially in neurology in rheumatology etc right sir thank you for sharing your thoughts on that sir Uh, so probably the last question that we will be taking up as well sir from this in the interest of time uh, is how are these immunomodulatory drugs that have come up newly in the management of myeloma or cll how have they been if they have been used in conjunction with ibig sir is the next question well i don't think uh, see i think uh, 
there's nothing much to say about using in conjunction but yeah. see many of these immunomodulatory drugs uh, like for example we looked at uh, uh, ibrutinib uh, and uh, for example just the b cell depleting antibodies etc so that is being increasingly used and uh, many patients are on continuous therapy especially in cll uh, right. which means that uh, they do have profound hypogamma globulinemia very often uh, they're not symptomatic from it but when you see a symptomatic patient with hypogamma globulinemia i think it's always worth replacing uh, iv immunoglobulin so that is the way to use iv immunoglobulin would be to periodically firstly to be aware of the complication of low globulin and uh, periodically check the immunoglobulin levels and if you have a patient who has got hypogamma globulinemia and recurrent infections and to use them as appropriate right sir yes thank you for that sir so another question that's come up is sir so how frequently do we monitor the immunoglobulin levels is in general practice uh, is it a set criteria or it depends on the patient's current conditions okay so you can say i think there are some studies which establish like those two graphs that unfortunately didn't come up very well on my computer because this is a uh, uh apple i think we uh, that was done on microsoft uh, <laughs> sure, yeah. yes, so yes, what, yes. what 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 those two graphs showed was that uh, the trough level of about 400 to 500 uh, mg is um is protective so you could check your immunoglobulin levels every uh, four weeks but i don't think that is something you need to do in day to day practice i think in day to day practice you can set a target of giving iv immunoglobulin on a, a four weekly basis but often the financial issues do uh, take over so you know ideally every four weeks but sometimes you keep extending it to six and eight weeks depending upon the affordability of the patients right but you base it on clinical response you know if you give ivig let's say for two three months you periodically replace ivig and the incidence of infection has come down it doesn't matter what the trough iv uh, trough immunoglobulin levels are uh, you can just use that frequency right sir yes so i think that brings us to the end of the questions as well sir and it has been very well addressed thank you for that sir so with that sir i think we also request your closing remarks for the session as well sir. so closing remarks should be see um, when it comes to managing these b cell malignancies you got so many things to think about of course ivig is not the one that you think about up front uh, you got uh, many therapeutic decisions to make but however this is an important aspect of uh, patient's care that you need to keep in mind especially if you look at uh, patients who have recurrent infections uh, always remember to check their immunoglobulin levels and see and consider giving iv immunoglobulin as a replacement Uh, especially in patients who are having b cell depleting agents like rituximab and more powerful anti cd20 antibodies uh, with the increasing uh, use of well we are not using much of car t cells but as car t cells become more and more uh, more and more uh, uh, for more frequently used you may have to not you may some of the cd19 specific car t cells result in severe b cell depletion and uh, low immunoglobulin so you have to most definitely use so it's a useful uh, therapeutic agent in certain selected patients in selected situations so something worth remembering right sir sure sir so thank you once again sir so it has been a very very insightful and a very valuable fruitful learning session for all of us and to all our participants and i'd like to thank all the participants who have taken off their valuable time for today's session and have posted their questions as well as it has brought out a lot of new ideas with respect to the treatment patterns around utilization of ivig and uh, once again thank you prabhu sir despite the busy schedule and the unprecedented covid situation you have taken off your time for us today and we hope to see you uh, see you in our future scientific engagements as well sir and uh, th- i would like to thank all our participants we hope to see you all in our future scientific engagements uh stay safe stay healthy and also uh, uh, do join us for our future sessions as well we wish you all a very safe uh, and good days ahead thank you thank you very much thank you thank you thank you prabhu sir thank you everybody good day